If you ask me who my God is, on whose name I call, if you ask me who my God is, He's the God of us all, Allah the Merciful. If you ask me what my book is that I hold in my hand, if you ask me what my book is, it's the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran. Hmm. Assalamu alaikum and peace, and welcome to this episode of Misconceptions. I'm your host, Muhammad Hashim, and with us in the studio today we have Yusuf Estes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. We also have in our studio today our studio audience. Assalamu alaikum. On this episode of Misconceptions, we're going to talk about the many misconceptions of the, the Holy Quran, inshallah. It's going to be a hard one, inshallah, Sheikh. So, uh, how do we begin talking about the many misconceptions of the Holy Quran? Well, first of all, let's talk about what the Quran is. Then we can talk about what it isn't. And then I think we should take some questions from our brothers in the audience. Okay. What is Quran? Quran is an Arabic word that has to be understood in Arabic, not in English, because there's no word in English really that represents all of this. What we can say though is that it comes from the root Qara, and the closest word that we found is recite or recitation, that which is being recited. Now, there's an expression that comes from the angel Gabriel in the very beginning of the revelation of the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Iqara. Iqara. And many people have translated that to be the word read. And while we would say that that has some validity, at the same time we would say it isn't sufficient to convey the true message of Islam. Because at the time they first translated to English, the word read in English meant a reading. That people used to recite poetry. They would stand and recite from memory, and they called it readings. Also, when anybody did um, this palm reading, things like that, they mm. called those readings. readings. And when people would uh, read the bumps on somebody's head, they called those readings. So they said that the first word that came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the angel Gabriel was ikra, meaning read. And actually it should be recite because it's well known and well established in Islam. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never read anything, nor could he write. And if the Lord of the worlds, the creator and sustainer of the whole universe, doesn't know that Muhammad can't read and write, then there's no point in us even talking about it any further. That's a misconception in itself, the whole read and recite. I, I didn't know that. I thought it was a huge misconception read. because of the translation of the word back then. But a hundred years ago, it was used that way. They would say, for instance, come over to our home for a tea and a reading. So you would go there and have tea and listen to somebody recite poetry. I can give you an example from Walt Disney's Alice in Wonderland. When the girl who's along with her in the very beginning of the movie sees her asleep, she tells her to stand and recite. And they're outside under a tree. She says, stand and recite. Only she says, stand and read. Mm. That's what she said, stand and read. And so she began to recite after that. Mm. So this is how we understand read as versus this word uh, uh, recite and the word Quran. It is recitation. How we get that? It was recited to Gabriel. Gabriel then recites it to Muhammad, peace be upon him. Amen. He recites it to his companions. They recited it to others and so on until the very word we have today is the same word exactly as it was recited to Muhammad by the angel without any differences in it. It's, it's a miracle in itself just for that. Yeah. But I think it's good for us now to turn to our brothers in the audience and ask, for questions, have you heard any misconceptions people gave you about the Quran? Yes, I, I have a question, please. Uh, many people say that the Quran was found by the Prophet Muhammad. What's about that? Is that true? I've heard stuff like he found it in the cave. He went away for 40 days and he found it in the cave and he came back with all this uh, something that he found. 
I can understand where people could get that from. There have been other people who claim to have found things that came up out of the sea in gold tablets, finding things in caves, then claim to be prophets. But in this case, that would be absolutely the opposite because the prophet, peace be upon him, couldn't either read or write. So that being the case, how would it be that he found something and even knew it was writing anyway? And another point is, if he found something like this, then he must have found the original from something anyway because the Quran still today is unmatched by any other form of literature on the planet. There isn't anything else like it anywhere. The challenge in the Quran itself says, if you're in doubt about it, bring a book like it. Another challenge comes, just bring ten chapters like it. And finally, just bring one wow. chapter like it. And the smallest chapter is only three verses. And yet, till this day, nobody has produced anything from the point of grammar, the point of poetry, the point of meaning, and the point that anybody in any language can memorize it, even if they're not Arab. There are today more than 20 million human beings holding the entire Quran in their heart. Even in our own audience, we have some that have memorized the entire Quran. So, do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question. Yes, brother. Some people think that the Quran is beautiful, but just poetry. Oh, that's good. That was very common when I guess at the time of Prophet Muhammad, alayhi there were a lot of poets at the time. So, there's a connection there between beautiful Arabic poetry and, of course, the Quran. Yeah, some have opted out. They said, well, okay, yeah, he heard all this poetry and just put it together. Mm. But again, he said he was not a poet. And he's not a reciter. He even said, La Anabikari, when the angel Gabriel came to him and said to him, Ikra, read, he said, Ma Anabikari, I'm not one of those who does that. But he became the best of all reciters in reciting the words of Allah. So it is not poetry. It's not intended to be poetry. It's not science, not intended to be science. It is not just a book of uh, moral issues but rather it is Allah's recitation to us. It is a miracle. And it exists to convey a special message to all humans and jinn alike. Mm. Any other questions? Actually, I read on some web pages, they say that Quran is nothing else than a takeoff of a Bible. Or that it was taken from words of a Byzantine slave who lived in Mecca at the time. Oh, okay, the Byzantine at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, did have some information of old manuscripts and they did refer to things that came from Jesus' time and also from the Jews. They may have mixed some of it even with the teachings of the Majusi, the fire worshippers, the Magi. But I would think that it would be pretty obvious if anybody just looks to the Quran itself and what it's teaching, and the construction of Arabic to realize that it couldn't have been something coming from the Byzantines, because number one, they didn't have Arabic. Okay. okay. And number two, if this slave is having all this going on for him, that he has all this, then I guess he would have been the prophet himself. But as far as taking anything from the Bible, or from anything from Christianity, at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which was the 6th century, this would have been invalidated immediately by all the scholars of the Bible because they tell us that even after the second century, not a single shred of anything original or even a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of anything original existed. And we can verify that on our website called BibleIslam.com. They can verify that real easy. So um, I think in summing it up to this point, we have to understand the Quran is God's word, his real words in the Arabic language, but it's not exclusive only to Arabic. Some people think that, but it also has words that come out of the Hebrew language, other Semitic languages, and languages uh, uh, dominant at that time on the earth. The thing that we want to remember is, though, that how it came to Muhammad is what makes it the miracle. And how it came to us today is the miracle. Regardless of, if you said, well, we found this word could be from Hebrew, or this word, it could have been from the Greeks, or whatever. Names of people are also mentioned in there as well. What we understand, though, is the teaching behind the whole thing. 
than it was to the humans of that time as it is to the humans of this time. Sheikh, is there a misconception about why Arabic? Why, why was it? Why yeah, I've heard Arabic that myself. Yeah, people will ask, why did it have to be in Arabic? It yeah. says in the Quran, it is a recitation in the language of Arabic. It says it very clear. Why does it have to be in Arabic? Well, for one thing, and a lot of people have recognized this, that over the years, the Quran has been recited exactly the same in a language that's still alive. Whereas with the ancient Hebrew, that's not spoken anymore. anymore. Ancient Greek is not spoken anymore. Aramaic. The Aramaic <sighs> is spoken, but only in one place on earth, in Syria. And that's by the Syrian Christians there. If you really examine the evidences that we have with us, you realize that it's impossible for anybody to make up something like this. And it's also inappropriate for us to consider that Muhammad could have possibly come up with it, considering A, he was totally Ill illiterate, but B, his character was so known to be honest that he couldn't have lied. He couldn't be so honest since the time of his birth for 40 years and all of a sudden just become a liar. He would have no experience. He wouldn't have been a very good one, would he? And to be able to lie about 604 pages straight in a row of beautiful prose and just come up with this and just say, oh, I made it all up. What is that? There are things within the Quran itself that indicate that he couldn't have come up with it. For instance, the admonitions he's receiving from Almighty God directed toward him, telling him, you frowned and you turned away from the one who wanted to be enlightened, because he had done that, so he was being admonished by Allah. And another one, you made something haram or forbidden that I didn't make forbidden, and that also was admonishment from Allah to him. So we can look at a lot of evidences about that, but suffice to say, if you want to know more about Allah's Quran, you can go to another website we have called Allah's Quran.com. No apostrophe, by the way. Okay, we're going to go to a quick break, inshallah. You're watching Misconceptions right here with myself, Muhammad Hashim, and Sheikh Yusuf Esther. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Hopefully we'll discuss some, some tips on, on how to increase the, the ability of getting the du'a or the supplication answered. Allah delays giving you what you want and gives you a reward that is equal to that or better in this life or in the world to come uh, for giving you your sins and giving you good deeds. I'm going to look at some questions that we've asked some of our brothers on the street. Uh, we asked them, should Muslims have a dialogue with other religions? We're going to need some stability. So. We, uh, it doesn't matter where we live, we need to care for those ones to give them the rights that Allah gives. This life is not the eternal life, it is a test. Particularly for the youth of today. So if there are any parents or uncles or whoever is watching, if you have 16, 17, 18, 20 year olds with you, make sure they stop doing whatever they're doing and come in and watch this show, inshallah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and peace and welcome back to this show of misconceptions. Today's misconception is the, all the, oh, some of the misconceptions about the Holy Quran, inshallah. Where we left off, uh, Sheikh Yusuf, about the Holy Quran, what else can we say? Well, one of the things that people talk about is that the Quran, as you mentioned, has been uh, discovered somewhere. The brothers talked about that maybe he found it somewhere. The Prophet came up with this on his own, made it up, all these different things. And then today we hear people saying things about changes to the Quran, that something was changed during his time or after his time. Oh, even uh, I heard about a new Quran that came out, something called al Khan, And this one is so bad. It was such a bad thing to start with. And then the one who wrote it, not only that, he attributed it to the United States government and said that they came up with it and mm. so on. And he was actually not a Muslim himself. Mm. 
Uh, in fact, I heard he was later arrested for trying to burn up his own house by setting fire to it with his tax records. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, for enough to say that the, these misconceptions are just, uh, they're laughable at best, you know. Mm. Let's see if we have any other questions from our brothers. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Some people are saying, how can you believe in the Quran when it's full of killing and uh, violence? I guess the point. Quran, I guess the misconceptions about the Quran have been associated with violence and killings. It's all about war and you know, I have to kill you and you have to kill me and that's what people look at it as. And yeah, well, I think that's because they never read it. That's the simplest answer to that one is they've never read it. Had they read it, they couldn't say that. But what they can find about war is that it's forbidden for us to even take a single life. A single innocent life is forbidden and you go to hell forever and it is as though you killed all the human beings. That's what's taught in chapter 5 of the Quran, clearly. Now, when it talks about war, it tells us what the limits of war are. Long before the Geneva Convention, we find that in the Quran, here are limitations in war that were never ever expressed in any other society especially not in such a collection, saying you can only meet them with what they meet you with and not more than that. If they come with swords, you could only go with swords. You wouldn't be allowed to come in here and blow the whole community away with an atom bomb and things like this. You can't do that. You can resist them up to what they're doing to you. It says that you can engage with kital against them as they kital against you or combat. But that's it. If they stop, you have to stop. Why? Because then you're the aggressor. Verily, Allah doesn't love the aggressors. In addition to that, we find that the teaching here now is you can kill them if they're killing you. And you can cause this terrorism to stop. I like to use that word because it's so popular right now that Islam is actually showing a war against terrorism with what is called kital. And we've talked about jihad in some of our other programs, but we've made it clear again and again and again that never is Islam allowing warfare against people who want peace, nor those who are willing to live with us in peace regardless if they accept Islam or not. I think that misconception would, would be a non-Muslim conception. What about Muslims' misconception in the Quran? Oh, you have Muslims today who want to take this uh, concept to another level so they can use it to attack and get vengeance on things that have happened to them. Okay. So they'll say Islam is saying this so that they can engage and bring other Muslims into the picture on what they want to do. But it is clear in the Quran, in Arabic, and from the teachings of Muhammad, that the limits are there forever. And it's not possible to twist that around. Although a lot of people try to do so, but Allah knows best what they're all scheming and trying to do. I think maybe we should take another question after that one. Yes. Yes, sir, I have a question. Why do some people hold the Quran over their heads in marriage or in celebration or in, in, or in protesting? Excellent question. All the superstition surrounding the Quran. And if Ooh. I put it up there, this will happen. If I put it down there, that will happen. Ah. Good luck and all that. Yeah, all right, all right. Big misconception. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. I've been in countries where they have a marriage or celebration, yeah. and then as the couple is moving out to their vehicle, going out the door, like in the Christians are throwing rice at people, do, mm -hmm. and they don't know that that's also a superstition. But anyway, here's now the Muslims coming along with their superstition, holding the Quran over somebody's head, and then they keep that Quran as a token of their marriage, and they put it up on a high place. Other Muslims are putting their Qurans up in high places, hang it in a bag in some of the countries in Indonesia, places like that where they have a lot of dampness, so they believe it needs to be up there so it won't get I've damp. I've seen it under people's pillows and stuff. That Put it under the pillow. No uh, one tonight. told me in California, he said, my parents are not really Muslims, but we came from a Muslim country. So uh, they kept the Quran up high in a closet. And whenever they get poor or needed money, they would put some, a dollar in there or something and close it. And then when they got money back, they'd go get their dollar back out of it or something like this. Yeah, that's it. That's all they use it for. Uh, he became a Muslim, by the way, and became very mm -hmm. famous. Um, but uh, anyway, the subject is about the Quran and misconceptions. And there's a lot of superstitions, like whenever people go into their, uh, you mentioned celebrations, different kinds of things they do with the Quran. Also, that when they protest, they hold up the Quran like that. Yeah. 
And they get to the point where if they believe that if anybody touches the Quran, it's going to be bad luck for all of us Like if he's not a Muslim and things like this. Uh, what we do have, though, about touching the Quran is that we, as Muslims, don't touch the physical Quran if we're in a state of janaba, mm -hmm. if we're not clean, uh, purified. We need to purify ourselves, uh, wash up for it. So we misunderstand another verse in the Quran that said that only the pure can touch it. But that verse does not refer to any human or jinn. It refers to angels. Okay. It refers to the angels. So we, from our standpoint as Muslims, don't touch it unless we have uh, cleaned ourselves from any defilement. Okay, but, but it doesn't apply to non-Muslims. So if a non-Muslim picked it up or something, you don't have to go, put it down, put it down, the house will fall down on us or something like that. You know, it's bad luck or you, you don't need to worry about that. What we would like to offer, though, is that people would respect the respect Quran. It, yeah. yeah, show respect. But I, I, I don't think I've really run into any serious problems with that once I've explained to people how we really feel about the Quran. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes, brother. Uh, my question is, uh, can you give the Quran uh, to a non-Muslim uh, to read? Well, that fits perfect with what we're talking about, doesn't it? I've heard a lot of that. And I actually gave the Quran to a non-Muslim and I was told that you shouldn't have. And was it a translated version or was it just an Arabic version? If it was translated, it's okay. And if it was Arabic, don't do it. Or well, you shouldn't have done it. Okay, suppose there's an Arab Christian. He would like to read the Quran. What do you got to do? Give him a translated version that he can't read? Mm. I'm asking you. How will he know? Can he listen to the Quran? Remember, the Quran is not the Quran unless it's being recited anyway. What you hold in your hand is not a Quran. It's called scripture in Arabic, Mus'haf. That's very clear. What you hold in your hand is not a Quran. It represents Quran. Let me explain it like this. If you have a dollar bill from the United States in your hand, that is the representation of wealth, gold or silver, that's stored somewhere else, true or false. The bill itself isn't worth that. It's not made out of silver or gold. A dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill costs the same to print. There's no difference. It's ink and paper. What makes it have a difference is what it's worth when you turn it in, true or false. It represents wealth. Mm -hmm. So the same way the Mus'haf represents what's being recited. Still we respect it. Still we honor it. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand the Quran itself was only recited by Muhammad, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. Never written by him. It was written by his followers. And then later on after he was gone, some of them decided, you know, let's compare what we have and make sure that we didn't make errors in our writing and that's why they brought those who memorized to sit there and recite to verify what had been written down and then destroy everything starting fresh just to be sure from this point forward we only have what is being recited. Today when we recite the Quran in front of a teacher and he's giving us what's called ijaza or um, ijaza? scholarship. Somebody has memorized Quran from you then you give them permission at that stage. You've given them their, um, their a decree saying that, yes, this student has passed. Achieved a certain level. Yeah, he, no, he's completed it. Okay. okay. And now he has his diploma. Let's, let's call it that. The Jaza like diploma. You, you graduated. Now, along with it, we're going to put all the names of all of the people all the way back to the mouth of the prophet, peace be upon him. So that you can say, well, I got it. Mine is coming from Abbasi or uh, Ibn Matsud or so-and-so or such-and-such. And him to him to him to so-and-so, word for word, letter for letter, and there's no difference. And everywhere I've been on this planet, I have found that every single reciter of Quran has the same exact words. Pronunciation varies because there were no vowel markings. As long as the word implied the same thing, you could say, for instance, this and that means what? Same thing. These and those means the same thing. Okay. And you find it in whom and him in Arabic. Alayhim, alayhum. And this is one of the different types of reciting, but it doesn't change the meaning.
Another thing is when people talk about abrogation, saying something came and supplanted something else in the Quran. But rather they should use the word augmentation because it didn't change the meaning of something. It didn't throw something away as in abrogation. It does do what's called augmentation, which means that, for instance, we'll give the example, the Quran says, don't approach Salah. When you're drunk, mm. don't approach the prayers while you're inebriated. Then later it says, don't drink at all. It forbids drinking altogether. Now how do we understand that? Well, one came first, the other came second, but one didn't cancel the other. It's augmentation, not abrogation. Well, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for watching uh, Misconceptions. I'm your host, Muhammad Hashim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ask me who my prophet is. I will say, haven't you heard? His name is Muhammad. A mercy to the world. A mercy to the world. If you ask me who my enemy is, I will say, don't you know? If you ask me who my enemy is, he's that same old devil, that same old devil.